Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the Nicomachean Ethics and the Eudamian Ethics, the Nicomachean Ethics has a longer discussion of this. The Eudamian Ethics, which is less often looked at as a complementary, but also somewhat shorter discussion of this. We have a virtue that often doesn't get talked much about in terms of virtue ethics, and even in terms of Aristotle. That is the virtue of magnificence, and Aristotle thinks that this is particularly important. It's important enough to treat it in the same section as another virtue that's similar to it but on a smaller scale, liberality or generosity, which I've, I've shot another video on. <clears throat> and like liberality, it is concerned with how and on what wealth or possessions or you could think of it as capital gets, gets spent. It's not concerned with one other thing that liberality is concerned with, which is where are you getting your money from. Um, that would actually be for Aristotle probably on this sort of scale something more like uh, a concern of justice. Why doesn't this get discussed? I think there's a, a few different reasons. One is that people say, well, you know, you looked at liberality, magnificence is just liberality on a big scale, so if you've seen liberality, you've seen magnificence, just kind of extrapolate from that. Um, you know, we're always pressed for time, so that I, I could see people doing that in their classes quite easily. Um, I think another more important reason is that we tend to be fairly egalitarian in, in our, our teaching and our, our research and all that sort of stuff in our society. And magnificence is not a, an, an egalitarian virtue as such, meaning that not everybody can participate in this, not everybody can cultivate this virtue. There, on the other hand, not everybody can have these vices either unless they're trying to uh, be magnificent when they simply don't have the means to do so. See, here's the thing. In order to be magnificent, you have to have a, you have to have a certain amount of what we might call capital, whether wealth or social capital or, or some other type. And like I put here, it's only possible for those who actually have wealth that can be spent or have connections, maybe family connections, maybe professional connections, who have fame or I think these days we would say celebrity of some sort. They can often motivate people to get things done. They can organize or some sort of um, resources that, that are being provided to you because of your family. And, and who you are. And these things can overlap. And, and in real societies, they often do tend to interfuse with each other, don't they? Now, what this means is that not everybody can be magnificent. So oftentimes, I think people are less interested in this because they say, well, if not everybody can be involved in this, then maybe it's not that important of a, of a virtue. But it really is a critical virtue. And Aristotle spends quite a bit of time on it and analyses on it because this is the stuff that that common social life, the fabric of the lives that we, we live, is formed of. See, for Aristotle, as for many other theorists, it's not enough when we think about common life to think about the state. And just to say, well, we have the state, the government, its institutions, they run everything, and private citizens don't make any sort of uh, contribution to it, or organizations. You could think of an organization being composed of a bunch of people that want to pool their resources to, to, to do something that would be magnificent. Um, what we would call civil society is going to be, to some degree, dependent on some people actually having this virtue of magnificence. 
Aristotle saw this in city-states, in Greek city-states. We often, I think, see this at the local level more than at the, the national level. But you could think of people who establish foundations as perhaps, depending on you know, where they fit in on this chart, exemplifying and, and uh, putting into action the virtue of, of magnificence. So, let's think about this. What are the sorts of things, what are the sorts of occasions where a person would display magnificence? And what this shows us, if we think about this, is that it's not just, you know, the biggest, gigantic expenditures. It can be family things as well. Um, a lot of families end up being important in communities, and, and that can... Uh, uh, be a grounds for, for exercising magnificence. Let's start with the sort of state or, or civilization or societal things that Aristotle himself talks about, and then we'll think about some, some modern day examples. So Aristotle talks, first off, about uh, equipping triremes. Now, what does that mean? A trireme was the standard naval vessel, and in ancient Greece, you had a lot of different city-states which would quite often go to war with each other or with non-Greeks, and Greece is, um, it's a maritime country. There were some city-states that were just landlocked, but they were fairly rare. Most of them were in the north. Um, and you needed boats, you needed ships to transport your soldiers, to fight the other navies, basically for protection. So equipping a trireme would be a, a fairly sizable expenditure. Um, and it would be a way in which you help out your particular city-state, your society. You are equipping them. You are, in effect, doing some of the defense budget. And you're doing it in a very particular way. This is the trireme that so-and-so bought. He also talks about doing things like this for temples. Um, it's very important when you see that sort of thing in Greek writings, not to think of this as a purely private matter the way many people tend to look at religion these days, but as a public matter. If there was a temple to Demeter, that's part of the city. And so buying some things for the temple, there might be some votive offerings that a person makes because of you know particular prayers. I don't want to get bogged down in Greek religion too much. But they also might do things to, you know, spruce up the temple. They might do things to put on a festival. Uh, here we start getting into some of the things, patronage of the arts that we might call it. But it's important to remember that a lot of the arts festivals were also religious festivals for the Greeks. Um, Aristotle talks about equipping a chorus and paying for a play to be put on. And a play was a very big production. It required you to have a playwright, actors, a chorus, costumes, a stage, um, training for, for a whole bunch of time, so, uh, oh, musicians as well, most likely, and this meant that somebody was actually shelling out money for that. He also talks about ways this can go, can go wrong and, you know, end up being a matter of vulgarity or lack of taste. Uh, but these are some standard examples. He, he does give um, quite a few other great examples that we would want to think about. Um... He also talks about sacrifices, public buildings, erecting a public building, laying out the money for that. Um, giving a banquet to the public. That was a lot more common in, in Greek times than it was in ours. Although you do find people underwriting things. This, you know, in our day we talk about this as underwriting or philanthropy or, or donations or things like that. He also talks about weddings. Now, weddings, you would say, that's a, a private, a personal thing, a family thing. Well, no, because a wedding actually does take place within a society. And that does, in fact, um, fit in with you know, the ways in which families are connected to each other. There's an old saying, when you marry a person, you actually marry their family. Um, so weddings would be part of this, and you can do them in a tasteful way. You can do them in a sort of mean, spend, you know, pinch every penny kind of way, and you can do them in a magnificent way. Um, people talk about this sort of stuff. Uh, believe me, when people go to a wedding and they get served a really, you know, they, they bring a good gift and they get served a really cheap plate, and the DJ is no good and the band is no good. 
they kind of feel like somebody was, was uh, being mean or stingy. Um, he also talks about welcoming foreign guests, celebrating their departure, not such a, such a big issue for us. Complimentary interchange of presents. This um, requires a little bit of explanation. For the Greeks, something that was called guest friendship, xenia, was very important. Families that were long established would have connections with each other to families in other city-states. And if I came to your city-state and I'm a guest friend, I would be expected to give you a gift and you would be expected to give me a gift in return. And you can do that. These would, these would not just be very small gifts, too. These would be you know, fairly big-ticket items. And why would you be doing this? Well, to show something good, to show something fine. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, he also talks about one other thing that's really interesting. And this is one thing that I think a lot of us can connect to. He talks about furnishing houses. The magnificent person furnishes his or her house, her dwelling. Uh, and I think we can see this with, with workplaces, with those who actually like, you know, own their own business or things like that. Um, there's going to be a focus on quality, on, on having things that convey a certain class, we might say. Now, you know, some people may see this as very classist or anti-egalitarian or anything like that. I'm just explaining what Aristotle actually says here. Um, there probably is an aspect of that. Um, but Aristotle thinks that there is, you know, a distinction. There's the higher, the noble, the better, the, the fine. Tokalon is what, what the Greeks would call it. And then, you know, going down, there's to eischron, the, the ignoble, the base, the dishonorable, um, the cheap, the tawdry. And you want to avoid that, and you want to have the nicer things. Aristotle actually, at this point, gets quite specific and says, the magnificent person in decorating their house is going to prefer a few nice things that are really lasting as opposed to, you know, other things. Now, let's talk, we've got a lot of examples there, and you could think of, I think, a lot of contemporary examples, you know, forms of philanthropy that people engage in, giving to colleges, giving to foundations, um, donating things to the local fire department, but I don't want to get too, too bogged down in those. We could go on to those examples all day long. Let's talk about the basic structure of this habit that the virtue consists in. So the magnificent person, like any virtuous person for Aristotle, there's a lot of rights, and it has to do not with um, taking, but with giving, with what they're spending their money on. They spend the right amount of money or resources or whatever you, you know, you're talking about, whatever kind of capital, on the right things. So it's not just enough to spend a medium amount. It, you're actually going to be spending a fairly large amount, but you spend it on the right things for the right occasions. Not just any time out of the blue. The magnificent person isn't the person who tries to make an occasion. You'll, they'll find enough occasions, enough things come up in social life where you can spend some money and, and accomplish something noble and good and memorable that you don't have to actually manufacture occasions. Um, all of this has to do with something that in Greek is toprepon, the suitable, the, that which is befitting, that which is proportionate to what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Now, what is going through the mind and through the heart of the magnificent person when they're engaged in giving or even later on when they're looking back at what they've accomplished and what they've spent. <laughs> they open up the checkbook and they look at the building and they say, well, it's a big donation. Um, their purpose is accomplishing something noble, something fine, something elevated. Aristotle says this goes beyond the realm of the merely necessary and starts getting towards what is more distinctively human, what elevates us, what, what takes us out of the realm of just the purely day-to-day -day getting by and gives us something that we can admire, something we can look up to, something that we can say, wow, yeah, that's really, that's really something worthwhile. I want, to, I want to be involved in that. I want to emulate it. I am proud of that. You could think of that as 
a person is willing to shell out money for something not just that they can be proud of, but other people who are involved in it can be proud of as well. That's a very important component, I think. The, uh, the person who is magnificent also, like Aristotle says, spends gladly and spends generously. They feel pleasure in spending that money. You know, that's an important point there. That really separates people out. Not everybody who's, who's, you know, hit up to make a donation spends generously, gladly, with pleasure. A lot of people do it very grudgingly. And that takes them over to this side, the vice of, of meanness. Now, these people actually do sometimes spend. It's not as if they don't spend at all. But they spend less than is actually right for the occasion. They're always trying to hold on to every little bit of resources that they have. And there could be a lot of reasons for this. Um, we're not going to dwell on those in, in part because Aristotle doesn't. And I think that could be something you can think of on your own. They're focused constantly on counting the costs. They pay attention to the cost much more than the magnificent person does. It's not as if the magnificent person just writes blank checks. But the magnificent person is less focused on the value of the money and more on the value of what the money can buy, what the money can make happen, um, only if it's spent, only if it's spent on the right things. This person is more focused on the money. They're more focused on what am I actually going to get back from this? What am I shelling this out for? Um, and they try to think of everything in terms of dollars. And they're always trying to try to lower costs, trying to conserve Costs, trying to be more efficient, trying to find ways to say, nah, we don't really need that. Think of a wedding, for example. You know, one of the things a, groom is, a groom's family is traditionally supposed to provide uh, is the beer, liquor, wine at the reception, if it's not a dry wedding, and the band or the DJ. There's a lot of ways you could try to cut co costs with that, right? Is it going to be an open bar or a cash bar? The generous person is going to be more inclined to say, let's do an open bar. Unless, of course, they're dealing with people who are total drunks, right? The uh, mean person is going to be more inclined to say, eh, let's do cash bar. I don't want to really pay for, for all these people. It's enough that I'm actually bringing the stuff here. Um, choice between spending a little bit more on a band and, and having a DJ the magnificent person is going to is going to shell out for the band because it's a more fun, authentic, you know, lively social experience. Whereas the DJ, eh, not so much. So this person is focused on counting and cutting the cost. They're pained. They feel pain when they spend. They feel less pain when they spend less. That's why they're trying to spend less. They think that they're spending more. This is a really interesting observation that Aristotle makes. When they look at what they're spending, it, their, their, their viewpoint is actually skewed. They think that they're spending the right amount. That's why they're vicious. There's a certain kind of blindness that goes with that. They think that they're spending more than they ought to, that other people are like drawing things out of them. And they become quite miserable and irritable with other people as, as a result. Let's look now at the other extreme. So there are some people who are perfectly willing to spend, you know, all sorts of money, all sorts of capital, all sorts of things. Just open up the, the purse, you know, or the pocketbook and just let's go. But it might not be for the right uh, things and it might not be on the right occasion. There are ways to, to spend and to give people things that are kind of vulgar, that are kind of low class. It's interesting, the term that we're translating here as lack of taste literally means not being able to find not just the suitable, but the noble. The word is, is uh, you know, literally from aporia and cologne, not being able to find your way to the, the fine or the honorable or the noble, that which is elevated. The... Um, person over here is willing to spend as much as they want. Oftentimes they spend beyond what is right and they spend it on the wrong things. Sometimes they actually give short shrift to the right things and they'll spend it on, on you know, things that are more visible, things that are easier to appeal to a larger crowd. 
you know, you could think, for example, of uh, Oprah, you know, everybody reaching under their chair. Oh, you've all got a car. Um, Aristotle would see that as vulgar. He would see that as, as going beyond good taste as just sort of leveling everything out and going for the easy, you know, grip at, at, at everybody's emotions kind of moment. And that, that comes from the fact that these people want to be big shots. They want to feel like they're the ones shelling everything out. They want to be the center of attention. They want other people to look at them. They want to feel as if they are really making things happen, really rich, admired. Um, and this is not a very good strategy for doing that, is it? Because as soon as the money's gone, people who are there with you just because you're, you're paying out for them, you know, if you have an entourage, as soon as that money's gone, they're gone. They don't really care about you. They're not really your friends. They don't really admire you because you're not spending your money to do the right things with your money. You're not spending it on things that are really beneficial, lasting, quality. You're just spending it on, you know, making everything have a, a good time, you know, for, for everybody, so long as it can hold out. Um, this person feels pleasure in spending, but they don't feel pleasure in a discriminate kind of way. Aristotle talks about the magnificent person as being discriminate, as being able to figure out what the right amount is, what the befitting is. This person over here lacks a sense of the befitting. This person over here lacks it in a very different way. This person is willing to spend, but they don't have a good sense of what they ought to be spending on. And they're probably not going to get good advice from other people because people, in fact, do like it when you spend money on them and on causes that they like. The person over here... Um, doesn't have a good sense of what's befitting. They, they don't see that if they let go, if they were a little bit more generous with their, their money, their resources, things would actually turn out better for them. The person here in the middle has a habit, has a, a aspect of their character that is built up over time in discerning what the right amount is, what the right occasions are, what the right purpose is, what we want to spend this money on. They will ask themselves that question, whereas this person will probably say, yeah, I really don't want to spend the money, or you want me to spend the money on that, and this person will say, yeah, okay, whatever, just let me give you a blank check, you just tell me whatever you want to spend it on, you're going to have my name on it, right? So you see that these are actually habits that people build over time. Now, the one thing I want to close with when we're thinking about virtues and vices, particularly when we're thinking about virtues that can't be practiced by everybody, one of the things that I think we want to devote some thought to is thinking about how do we actually cultivate these? How would you, and I'm going to just leave this as a challenge, how would you prepare people who right now don't have a lot of means? Think about college students, for example, who don't have a lot of means, to be magnificent rather than to be mean or to be vulgar. Well, you know, maybe the decoration thing is one way to get, get in at this. Maybe volunteering is another way to think of it. Maybe um, being trained in the virtue of liberality or generosity is in fact some sort of bridge to training for this larger scale virtue of magnificence. But those are just sort of beginning points. I'm going to leave off with, with that, and you can reflect on it.